Good morning. My name is Scott. I'm one of the elders here at Emmanuel. I'm really glad that you're here looking out. I see, see it looks like maybe half of us are on vacation or traveling. Um, just we'll pray for, uh, pray for their quick return. Just want to uh, dismiss the children up to grade three this morning. Uh, if we have any. I want to start a prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that uh, I pray, Lord, that, that, that I am changed by your word this morning. And I pray that for, for all of us, for all of us here. I pray for everybody who's traveling this week, not worshiping with us today, but uh, Lord, we just have to hold them in our hearts. Pray for Pastor Brad and his family. We're thankful that they're able to take some time together. We pray that we have a great time and we look forward to their return. For all these things, we'll pray only in the name of Jesus Christ. So my message this morning is called A Heavenly Legacy. And we're going to look at two legacies as we review Genesis 35 and 36 this morning. So over the last couple of months, we've been studying with Pastor Brad the life of Jacob in a series that he's, he's titled The uh, Family Divided. We saw Jacob and his mother deceive his father Isaac into giving him the birthright that should have been his brother Esau's. And Jacob had a vision of a staircase, remember this, coming down from heaven. And God spoke to Jacob. God gave Jacob a promise, which was the same promise given to Abraham and Isaac. And he also said, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. We talked last week about this being a one-sided promise, which is a good thing. So we find out that Jacob has no power to hold up his end of the deal. It's a good thing for Jacob and for us. In chapter 31, Jacob fleed Laban uh, with his wives and children, and God called Jacob back to Bethany, to the land where God first called him. But Jacob is not yet obedient <coughs> to the call of God. In chapter 32, we saw Esau coming for Jacob with 400 men. And Jacob is scared, but before Esau and Jacob meet, Jacob wrestles with an angel of the Lord and, and renames him Israel. But it seems the name doesn't stick because the next few chapters, the Bible still refers to him as Jacob, not Israel. And we really don't see any real change in Jacob's heart. In chapter 33, Esau and Jacob come face to face again after 20 years. And, and Esau and his 400 men, they do not kill Jacob, but rather Esau wants to reconcile him. And they tra and travel together to Sair. But Jacob doesn't want to. He fools his brother into going out ahead while Jacob goes instead to Shechem. And in Shechem, chapter 34, we talked last week that this was a dark chapter with horrible, horrible actions. No sign of willingness to submit to God. And there isn't even a mention of God in the whole chapter. We saw how Jacob was not the spiritual leader that his family needed. How he had a very poor record. And at the end of chapter 34, we saw that Jacob and his clan, they, they needed to flee the region. But then last week, we studied Genesis 35, where God calls Jacob one more time. We talked in detail about Jacob rebooting, resetting. He, he renewed his relationship with God. So Jacob and his family reset. He goes back to where it all began for him. He identifies who he and his family will follow, the one true God, the God of the Bible. He settles it in his heart once and for all. Do you ever feel like that? It's good to have something settled in your heart. That's what it was for Jacob. And then they, they finally rid themselves of all the false gods 
that were still that they were still holding on to up to this point. And we are, we examined ourselves to determine if there were any false gods in our own households that we need to be rid of once and for all. And we saw how God had to remind Jacob who he was. And he reminded him that he was renamed. He said, hey Jacob, your name's not Jacob. Remember? You've striven with God. Your name is Israel. And so we need to remember who we are in God. And then, as God re-pronounced the promise made earlier, we saw that the promise is unchanged. It's been unchanged for several generations at this point. And it's unchanged despite the utter failures of Jacob. He failed in obedience to God. He failed to be the spiritual leader of his family. And yet, God's promise is unchanged. And we are reminded that God made us a promise, too. He promised me. He promised you. He promised all who are his. Paul, the Apostle Paul, he opens up his letter to the Romans this way. This is Romans chapter 1. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. By his resurrection from the dead, Christ Jesus our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. That is, all who are his are called to the promise of the gospel of grace. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the promise. I'm constantly blowing. Like Jacob, I don't want to, but I blow it. And I'm so glad that God isn't depending on me. Do you ever feel that way? Even though you may feel like you've completely ruined your chances, remember that Jesus has already paid the full price for our sins. It's been promised. Check this out in, in Psalm 103. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. It's been promised. Look at this in 2 Corinthians. For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul opens up his letter to the church in Ephesus this way. This is uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Even as he chose us, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. It's been promised. Romans 6.23, we've been here many times. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't it awesome that the promise does not depend on me? or you, or Jacob. So that brings us through Genesis 35, verse 15. And we'll pick up this morning in verse 16. We're covering Genesis 35, 16 through 36, 43 this morning. So starting, in, uh, starting in chapter 35, verse 16, it says this. Then they journeyed from Bethel, when they were still some distance from Ephraim, Rachel went into labor, and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, 
She called his name ben but his father called him Benjamin. So that means Rachel named her son, son of my sorrow. But then Israel named him son of the right hand, which means somebody of importance. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephraim, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. And so most generally agree that Moses is the author of Genesis. And so Moses is saying that the pillar of the tombstone that was uh, still there, was still there at the time of his writing. Pick it up in verse 21. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of him. So I feel like I need to stop here a moment and address this issue of concubines in the Bible. It's not what this morning's message is about, but I feel like we need to just take this quick detour this morning. Um, I, I can't just read over it and, and move on. But it's true, concubines that are part of the culture and times for people of influence uh, in Jacob's time. Concubine, it's more than a mistress, less than a wife, sort of a second-class wife, but not a secret. And so there are those that will say, well, polygamy is in the Bible, so to them I say, murder is in the Bible. Deceit is in the Bible. When the Bible says something existed, it's, it's recording a historical fact. It's, it's not condoning it. No more than it would condone murder or any of the other treachery that you see. So let me be perfectly clear, concubines or multiple wives, they're, they're not part of God's plan for marriage. They never were. How do I know? We go back to the beginning of Genesis, right? Genesis chapter two said, Gen excuse me, Genesis chapter two says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. Furthermore, Exodus 20, 14 says, you shall not commit adultery. So that Jacob and others had concubines or more than one so-called wife, that does not mean that this is part of God's plan. Yet we still read in Romans 8, 28. This is important. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. What is done with evil in mind, what's done with malice in mind, what's done in ignorance, what's done in direct disobedience to God's word, God can still use for his purposes. We see this when we fast forward to Genesis chapter 50. Remember Joseph? He's one of Jacob's sons. Remember, he was sold into Egyptians, uh, Egyptian slavery by his brothers. <laughs> was that good? Or was that sinful? It's sinful, right? But as the years pass, Joseph gains more and more authority until he becomes governor of the region. Wow. Joseph is now, he's a seriously powerful dude, right? And in a very comedic turn of events, the same brothers that sold him into slavery now appear before him, asking for food. Imagine how they're shaking in their boots when they realize who they're talking to. But Joseph says this to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Do you remember that Joseph, he had this gift of prophecy, and he foresaw the coming fact. And when he was able to prepare for it, it kept the region healthy and strong. Even during the famine, none of this could have happened if Joseph, Jacob's son, hadn't been maliciously sold into slavery by his brothers. In the beginning of the book of Acts, the early church in Jerusalem, so ferociously persecuted, that Acts says the people were scattered. 
prior to this, the Christian church was pretty much confined to the region of Jerusalem. But with the persecution and the resultant scattering, the church began to move to the four corners of the world. So whatever the circumstance, whatever the circumstance, God uses it for his good and holy purpose. Even if the circumstances, multiple lives. So this notion of, of God working all things together for good, all things including disobedience, even malicious intent, even ignorance or disobedience. This notion is important to understand as we continue in chapter 35, verse 22. Now the sons of Jacob were 12, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's first one, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan and Nathal, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. So these sons listed here are the 12 tribes of Israel, born of two wives and two more servants. So it's important to remember that all things work together according to his purpose for his glory. So another quick detour here, uh, and then we'll get right back. Abraham is, is the one to receive that original promise of many nations. Abraham, you probably remember, was already an old man and childless when he received the promise. But God promised Abraham a son, who was Isaac. And Isaac had Jacob, who was renamed Israel. And from Jacob Israel came the 12 tribes of Israel. And we see God's hand at work. But remember that Abraham had a previous son, Ishmael, not by his wife, but by Hagar. And Ishmael's descendants were also foretold to become a numerous and, and become a great nation. Today, Ishmael's descendants is the Arab world, but Ishmael is, is not the son God promised to Abraham and from whom would come the 12 tribes of Israel. God said he would establish his covenant Isaac. Back to Genesis 35. We're now in verse 27. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Thonra, or Kirath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last. And he died and was gathered to his old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So you see what's, what's going on here. Brad has been teaching these last couple months through the series that he called A Family Divided. But Genesis 35 ends with a family united. Jacob is now walking with God and is able to bury his father, surrounded by family. Genesis 36 now verses 1 through 5. It lists the sons of Esau, Jacob's brother. I won't read it through right now, but you can see that Esau, he's, he's really doing pretty good. Picking up in uh, verse 6. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went into a land away from his brother Jacob, for their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. The land of their sojourners could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Salem. So as you remember, Esau is the older brother of Jacob. And Jacob deceived his father into giving him the birthright inheritance instead of Esau. And Esau was, he was angry. He was mad about being cheated. But it seems like Esau did okay anyway. So in verse 9, we see that Esau is the father of the Edomites. The Edomites were an important group as the story of history unfolds. Later, 
After 40 years of wandering through the wilderness, Moses brings the Israelites to the promised land. But the Edomites refused to let them go through their land. You see this in the book of Numbers. This was a huge setback for Israel, and they had to go around Edom. And then, for the remainder of the chapter, we see recorded the generations of Esau, the Edomite. The prophets, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they both speak out against the evils of the Edomites, including in this list here, in Genesis 36, is uh, Amalek. From Amalek comes, as you might guess, the, the Amalekites. And the Amalekites are a future enemy of Israel. In Exodus, Moses and Joshua have to battle against the Amalekites. Edom becomes a mighty nation, but it's a dark place. So let's talk about legacy. What is legacy? It's what's left behind after we die. We often talk about what we will leave behind if we die. We write wills, we divide our assets, we, we pass our belongings out to those we love, those we care about. Most typically, those things are given to a younger generation. Whenever it's passed on to individuals, whether it's passed on to individuals we love or, or given to a church or given to a charity or a hospital or whatever, the assets, the material goods, whether it's money or other possessions, the assets are left behind in hopes that it will somehow benefit the next generation, maybe even several generations. And so many of us will plan. We might meet with lawyers, financial planners. Some of us may draw the will, all in an effort to do what? To leave a legacy. We feel good to know that we might be able to leave a little something to those we love in the next generation. And that's not a bad thing. But there's another kind of legacy that I want us to think about. It's a legacy that can't be counted in dollars and cents. It's a legacy that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob left behind. It's a legacy of faith that continues to this day. Jacob and Esau were both wealthy men of influence. No doubt each when they passed left the legacy of possessions. But where is that fortune now? It's destroyed by moth, by rust, by thieves. But the legacy of Jacob returning to God, the legacy of Jacob getting back to where it all started, the legacy of Jacob settling in his heart once and for all that he was going to follow the one true God, the one true God of the Bible. The legacy of Jacob shedding all the false gods within his household. The legacy of Jacob knowing who he is in God. The legacy of Jacob trusting in the promise of God. This legacy is forever. This legacy has great impact not only on the next generation of Jacob's family, but it has great positive impact on the whole course of human history. And it continues to this day. Make no mistake, Jacob made big mistakes. As we saw. Yet still, Jacob leaves behind a great legacy, the beginnings of a legacy of faith that is to eventually make God known to the four corners of the earth. We know Jacob's legacy because we are part of it. But what is the legacy that Esau left behind? Let's look at Esau. One of our first encounters with Esau is when he sells his birthright for a bowl of soup. What a short-sighted, faithless act. We also see Esau marrying pagan women, which was forbidden. And we do not see any examples of Esau seeking after God. No examples of faith. Was he a good man? Sure, by some accounts, right? He, uh, he sought reconciliation with his brother who wronged him. He acted kindly to his brother. He amassed some wealth. He has flocks, sons, grandsons. From the nation of Esau comes political leaders, kings, chiefs. And these kings are, are reigning before any of Jacob's descendants had any power. But we 
we don't see faith. So what then of Esau's legacy? What is Esau's legacy? In Malachi chapter 1 and in uh, Romans chapter 9 it says that Jacob, Jacob was loved by God but Esau was hated. <coughs> the Edomites and the Amicalites become enemies of Israel. The book of Obadiah in the Old Testament calls for the destruction of Edom. Esau is not part of God's plan. Jacob is. Jacob is the one who leaves behind a heavenly legacy. What is a heavenly legacy? Why do we lie? Why do we need to leave the next generation with a heavenly legacy? Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on heaven. I'm sorry, let's try that again. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and loss, moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Are we to leave a legacy of wealth to the next generation? Or a heavenly legacy? <coughs> the legacy of wealth or possessions will be destroyed by moth, by rust, by thieves. But I want to suggest to you that the heavenly legacy <coughs> is like storing up treasures in heaven. You've heard it said that we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. I say that's true. But what is also true is that we are not always the ones that do the reap. The next generation also reaps what we sow. When we sow the seeds of greed, the next generation reaps the fruit of greed. When we sow the seeds of false gods, the next generation reaps the fruit of false gods. When we sow the seeds of a false gospel, the next generation reaps the fruit of lies. When, when we sow the seeds of short-sighted, godless decisions like we saw, the next generation reaps the fruit of unrighteousness. When we sow the seeds of neglecting God's word, the next generation reaps the rotten fruit of sin. If we sow the seeds of self, the next generation suffers. If we sow the seeds of walking in the flesh, the next generation reaps death. Check this out from Romans chapter 8. This is verses 5 through 8. <coughs> For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That is to say, the wages of sin is death. Is that our legacy? Is that what we are to leave to the next generation? No. Let's leave a heavenly legacy. Let's leave a legacy of life a legacy of peace for the next generation. What does that look like? What does a heavenly legacy look like? A heavenly legacy is a legacy of faith. Romans 4 says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir to the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It continues in verse 20 and 21. No unbelief made him, Abraham, waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Did you hear that? That's, that's what I want for us. Be fully convinced that God is able to do what he promised. What is that promise to us? 
we can rest in the certainty of our salvation in Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 23. Free, for, the, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is our promise. And we will not waver concerning this promise, but we will grow strong in our faith as we give glory to God, fully convinced that He is able to do what He promised. When we sow the seeds of faith, the next generation reaps more than we can imagine. What else does a heavenly legacy look like? A heavenly legacy is a legacy of love. You know the famous verse from 1 Corinthians, this is chapter 13, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy god or a clanging symbol. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. John 13, uh, John 13, uh, verse 34 to 35, Jesus says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. When we sow the seeds of love, the next generation reaps the fruit of love. It's a, gen it's, a uh, it's also a legacy of service. The legacy of service is like that of a legacy of love. Augustine, he wrote this. What does it look like? It has hands to help others, feet to hasten to the poor and needy, eyes to see the misery and want, ears to hear the sights. I Ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of men. This is what love looks like. Author G. Frederick Owen, he wrote this. Love has a hem to her garment that trails to the very dust. It can reach to the stains and... Let me start that again. Love has a hem in her garment that trails to the very dust. It can reach the stains of the streets and lanes. And because it can, it must. James says this in the book of James, chapter 2. I will show you my faith by my works. When we sow the seeds of service, the next generation learns how to serve. How else do we leave behind a heavenly legacy? Bible time, prayer time. We have to be in the Word. We need to know what God's Word says to us. Here's a few verses. Psalm 119 says, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. Deuteronomy says, But the Word is very near. It is in your mouth, in your heart, so that you can do it. For the word of God is a living and active, it says in Hebrews, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So Bible time and the next generation will reap will root the fruit of truth. How else do we leave behind the heavenly legacy? <coughs> it's a legacy of family. This is a call for all of us. It's a call for us to invest our time wisely. There are many distractions. There are many things that draw on our attention, draw on our time. But few things can build a heavenly legacy like family time. I'm speaking to us as parents, speaking to us as grandparents, speaking to us as children. Family time is precious time. Family time helps to create a heavenly legacy for the generations to follow. Chuck Swindoll 
said this, a family is a place where principles are hammered at home on the anvil of everyday living. Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from. Family time is the best time to demonstrate our faith. Family time is the best time to show love, to teach service. Family time is the best time for Bible time, for prayer time. When we sow family time, the next generation seeks to preserve family. When we sow the seeds of a heavenly legacy, future generations reap the fruit of that legacy in ways that we can't even imagine. So a heavenly legacy its a legacy of faith. It's a legacy of love. It's a legacy of service. It's a legacy of Bible time, prayer time legacy of family time. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the examples of Jacob and Esau. We thank you for the desire to leave behind for future generations a valuable legacy. Not a legacy of property or gold or silver. For that is destroyed by moth, or rust, or thieves. Not a legacy of selfishness or sin, but a heavenly legacy of lasting value. To do that, Lord, we must pursue you. May we, like Jacob, be a part of your master plan. Lord, thank you for your saving grace. That despite our sin, you would love us even to suffer and die on the cross, so that by your death and resurrection, we would be saved by faith. For all these things, we pray only.